Welcome to a special episode of the Cross Border Interviews. I am your host, Christopher Brown, and I'm thrilled to be sharing with you our coverage from the Saskatchewan Urban Municipalities Association Conference, which took place from April 16th to April 20th in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. During the conference, participants were given the opportunity to listen to the Honorable Don McMorris, Saskatchewan Party MLA and Minister of Government Relations, as well as NDP MLA Matt Love. Both spoke about their party's visions for municipalities across the province. We heard about their priorities, their plans for addressing the challenges that municipalities face in today's world. But that's not all. We, the Cross Border Interviews, had the opportunity to sit down with one-on-one -on -one interviews for both Nick Morris and Love, where we asked them about what they heard from the conference and how they plan, as their parties as well, will work with municipalities to achieve their goals. It was a fascinating and insightful discussion for both Nick Morris and Love. Also, during the SUMA conference, Saskatchewan Premier Scott Moe was in attendance while also pitching his government's vision for the province. We will play our interviews with both McMorris and Love after each of their respective speeches that they gave to the delegates. So buckle in as we bring you a look at the SUMA conference and the perspectives of key provincial political figures in Saskatchewan. First, we start with Minister Don McMorris. We will start with his speech to the conference and then get right into our one-on-one -on -one interview with the minister. Welcome to April 18th in Saskatoon and Regina, um, snowing uh, and a blizzard coming in. But certainly uh, I want to, uh, first of all, on behalf of the government of Saskatchewan, uh, thank you and say how lucky we are to be here on Treaty 6 territory, homeland of the Métis. When I was driving up yesterday from Regina, and as many that would have come from the southeast, you would have gone along Number 11 Highway and hopefully noticed some signs that uh, depict the, f the first time in Canada uh, treaty boundaries between Treaty 4 and Treaty 6. I never learned that in school, and I got to learn it on the drive up from uh, Regina to Saskatoon. Now I know, I think the Minister of Highways, Jeremy Cottrell, a member from uh, Battlefords is in the room, I saw him earlier. And I hope he's still here because with this storm, I'm not sure how many of our cabinet ministers will be here for the bear pit tomorrow. So for anybody that has questions, you have to, serp have, to have them directed towards either highways or government relations. There can be no other questions um, tomorrow. But anyway, I, I think, and I don't want to take uh, away from any of his announcements, but there'll be more of those treaty boundary signs going up uh, to signify the treaties that cover all of Saskatchewan because we're all treaty people and how I think significant that is as the first in Canada. Um, I also want to thank uh, Sumer for inviting me today and allowing me to speak at about, I think it was 2.15, might be 2.20 now, 2.30, because right now in Regina, question period is going on and I feel I can be more productive in these next 25 minutes than I would be in question period in the legislature. So thank you for allowing me to be here and it's hard to believe that this is the first uh, meeting here, SUMA meeting in, in Saskatoon since 2019. And you think of, uh, this is a, the farmer coming out of me, but all the water that's gone under the bridge in those last four, four and a half years. And I just want to, I know I mentioned it in uh, Regina last year, but I just want to thank you for all the work that you have done as local leaders uh, over those past four years. Some of you uh, weren't elected four years ago, but in the last uh, two or three years that you've been elected, I probably said last year, and I'm going to quickly say it again, I've been around for probably too long, 23 or 24 years, six or seven elections, and I would say the last four years have been the toughest. Not this past year, maybe quite so much, but for two or three years through the pandemic were the toughest years that I ever had to experience as an elected official because we make a lot of decisions at the local level and at the provincial level as the federal government does at the federal level, but none of those decisions I can ever remember had such an impact on every person in this province when we told people that they could have who they could have nobody at Christmas in their house and no government should ever have to make those decisions and no municipality should ever have to make those decisions and we pray that we never have to make those decisions again but thank you again uh, on behalf of all the citizens that you represent but also on behalf of a provincial government that was struggling to find our way through it 
and hearing from the city leader, the uh, community leaders, city, SUMA, SARM, uh, all the municipal leaders. I know we had many, many calls, weekly at times, uh, just to hear the input that you had and help, help us navigate those uh, absolutely uncharted waters. So I want to thank you again for all that, all the work that you have done. And I also want to, as this may sound unusual, uh, for your advocacy work. I know we're going to hear more of it in the dialogue sessions tomorrow, and I'm going to hear more of it in the bear pit. This is why this 20 minutes for me is really enjoyable, because I, don't, I just get to talk, and I don't have to answer any of your questions. I can talk about what I want to talk about. But I just want to thank you for your advocacy and, and the way that you present. Uh, you know, what you would like to see done in your communities. Uh, it's a respectful, I believe, relationship. I sure hope it is. Um, and uh, it would be a pretty boring convention if you didn't have something to ask government for. I mean, what would the media cover? It'd be just really boring. So thank you for your advo advocacy. And it does help us make better decisions. We don't always agree. And although we don't always agree, that does not mean we haven't listened. I think you can all relate as elected officials. Some people have had a number of different portfolios and I've really enjoyed every one of them, but this is a unique portfolio because every one of you in this room has gone through the same process that I have to be in this room, other than perhaps the administrators, but you had to get elected. You had to put your name on a ballot. And that is just not always the easiest thing to do. And so, uh, you know, the respect is there for the work that you do, and I hope uh, that respect is, is mutual. I want to just touch on a few things that, uh, as a province, that uh, we are working on. And it's really kind of on funding, and I know there's going to be certainly more talk over the next uh, 24 hours or 36 hours on municipal revenue sharing and other, uh, other programs. But I do want to talk a little bit on, on, first of all, municipal revenue sharing a little bit on the in Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program, a little bit on target sector support and the peer network, as well as I'm going to finish off with the process that we've been going through as a government and the responsibilities that I have as Minister of uh, First Nations, in, uh, First Nations Métis Relations regarding the, the duty to consult policy. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk on in the next few minutes. Some of it the Premier addressed. Yesterday, he covered a, an awful lot of bases. I'm going to keep mine a little more targeted towards just the uh, responsibilities that I have under uh, government relations. He mentioned yesterday, uh, I, I know because I was able to t tune in, uh, that uh, in 23-24, uh, there's a record amount of municipal revenue sharing at $298 million. That's up 13% from the previous year. The previous year dropped a few million dollars from the year previous. So if we're in 23-24, uh, 2223 was uh, a little bit 13% less. Uh, the year before it was the highest amount, and so this is the record year. Uh, and I believe you are seeing it in your communities, we're seeing it around the province, that the investment in this province is heating up. It's only going to get better, which PST is in charge on so many of those projects. I can only see that revenue sharing number going up uh, into the future. Don't hold me on that, but if I was a betting man, I would say it would be going up. You know, since we became government in 2007 and 8, um, at revenue, municipal revenue sharing, which you all know is no strings attached, over $4 billion has been distributed through municipalities with virtually no strings attached. And I was doing an interview earlier and uh, um, was talking about municipal revenue sharing, and I think it's a great program, and we would really like to see the next program from the federal government, ICIP, with very few strings attached, because I really do believe that you're the best ones to determine what needs to be spent in your own communities. I may not agree with, I don't know if there's anybody from Fort Capel or any of my, I may not agree with the street they're fixing in Fort Capel, but they're the ones that are closest to it, and they're the ones that make the decision. It isn't my decision. And so that's why I think the program is so, uh, so unique and so valuable. And, you know, it, it's really tough to compare province to province, apples to apples. Um, but in Manitoba, I do know that three months ago, they announced quite proudly that for the first time in seven years, they were not freezing municipal. And it's not municipal revenue sharing in Manitoba. It's under a different title. But for the first time, it, it's called municipal operating basket funding. They put it up. $47 million in Manitoba, 
to a total of $217 million uh, in total, which works out to $162 per person in Manitoba. If you take our $300 million divided by a growing population of over 1.2, uh, million, it's $248 a person in Saskatchewan. And in Ontario, they put about $500 million into revenue sharing, and if you extrapolate that, it works out to about $33 a person. These fine figures were worked on by my Chief of Staff. Thank you very much, Max, for that, that great work. But it is a program that I think if you were to talk to uh, colleagues in other provinces, you know, it's, again, it's always tough to compare complete apples to apples, but it's a program that we're very proud of. Not to say that it can't be tweaked, and I know there's a, there's a push by SUMA to change, whether it's the uh, PST on labor, on construction, or whether that percentage should change. A uh, percentage div divided between uh, the organizations that get it, which is SUMA, SARM, the New North, as well as then the targeted sector support, whether those proportions should change. And we're certainly up uh, and willing to take on those conversations. Uh, we have to balance it. I sit on Treasury Board, but we have to balance it with Mama Harpower, uh, the Deputy Premier and Minister of Finance. Um, she runs a tough bargain, but anyway, uh, we're certainly uh, willing to have those conversations as we move forward. On the other program that uh, has been significant, uh, for municipalities across the province is the ICIP program and of course I think most are pretty familiar uh, with the Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program uh, and what that has done for our province. Of course it's three ways, federal, provincial and municipal. I was certainly glad that uh, we were able to put a press release out today on some of the latest projects that have been approved uh, and, and agreements entered into with the federal government. $21 million uh, for an, another 21 infrastructure programs, projects across Saskatchewan. Projects such as the new facility going to be in Lloydminster. And the aquatic centre in Balgoni, the uh, rehabilitation of the Koshin water or uh, breakwater, and then a number of bridges uh, across the province. So it's been a great program over the last five to six years. It was supposed to sunset in 2018, but most provinces have burned through all, all the, uh, the allotment from the federal government. We have too. Uh, some 470 projects have been announced across Saskatchewan. Uh, over $700 million in the last five or six years uh, put into that program by the provincial government. And uh, that, again, leveraged with the, provincial, with the federal funds and the municipal funds means over $2.1 billion in infrastructure programs throughout the province is significant and you'd think that would have painted all the fence but there's more fence to paint. There's still more infrastructure uh, uh, projects that need to be undertaken. So I would just uh, ask you as you are great advocates, I know you're great advocates, to continue to advocate with the federal government as we will because next year we want to put more money into infrastructure but we want it to be on by, by all three levels of government. More money into infrastructure with less strings attached. We don't need to have a program that's designed for Toronto's uh, subway system to help us out in Lang, Saskatchewan. We need uh, programs that are going to uh, focus on, uh, I think, uh, community and culture and recreation uh, and wastewater and water projects. Uh, all, every community has struggles with that. So those, those are what uh, I think we're going to need. And, if the federal government would uh, continue to be a partner but with less strings attached, I think that would be valuable for all of us as we move forward. Uh, each year we take out of that municipal revenue sharing about $1.5 million and that goes into the targeted sector support initiative known as TSS. Uh, earlier this year our government and municipal, municipal sector announced more than $500,000 of provincial funding towards 15 new TSS projects. Uh, from four uh, application intakes. For example, $75,000 in provincial funding towards the town of Lanigan uh, Regional Emergency Measures Response Plan, uh, working with several other communities around uh, their area, and $25,000 in provincial funding to the town of Blaine Lake and uh, Marslin District Official Community Planning and Zoning uh, Bylaws. There is an intake going on right now. You only have 12 more days or 13 more days. It closes on, the fifth intake is closing on May the 1st. 
and I would encourage applicants to, um, if they can uh, find a project with communities around them, uh, apply because this money uh, needs to uh, help with communities uh, building cooperation between them and I think it's a great program. The final resource I wanted to talk about uh, to highlight is the Municipal Peer Network. This is a partnership involving the, the Ministry of Government Relations, SUMA, SARM, now these, this is a bit of a mouthful, the Urban Municipalities Association of Saskatchewan and the Rural Municipalities Association of Saskatchewan. All of those organizations go to uh, determining where that, those funds, uh, no, not determining where those, determining, uh, putting together uh, expertise in administration and in governance, as well as uh, with elected officials. Uh, so if you uh, feel this would be of benefit, it's a, it's a uh, resource that uh, is made available to you. Just in closing, and certainly not last uh, uh, but for least, but, but probably even most importantly, is the work that the ministry has been doing under government relations on engaging on the framework policy for a consultation, the consultation framework policy. The consultation framework policy has been in effect for about 10 years in the province and certain projects will trigger where consultation has to take place. There has uh, been some concern uh, from both parties, whether it's from First Nations or Métis, that the consultation process is not working very well for them. We also hear it from the, the industry. So what we did is embark on a, <clears throat> about it's been about an eight month process where we've engaged all the partners. SUMA, your organization has been one of the partners, SARM, uh, FSIN, uh, Métis Nation of Saskatchewan, the Mining Association, Chambers of Commerce, uh, Tribal Councils, every First Nation, all 74 First Nations and uh, Métis locals were invited to engage to let us know what was working right and what was not working. Uh, we've had that feedback, heard that feedback. We're in the process of kind of putting together what we'd heard and there's definitely some common themes uh, that, are, that are being uh, put forward and so we hope to then uh, for all the organizations that were involved, you will get a uh, kind of a report on the feedback that we'd heard, the common themes uh, that we'll be working on, and then eventually uh, a solution package as to what we think can make that framework policy uh, improve. Because it's important that we're all on the same page on this one. I, I, I'm at times wondering if we can make anybody happy on this one, but it is a, uh, after 10 years of non, uh, not being reviewed, it's extremely important that we've gone through that process. So thanks to your organization uh, for engaging on, on that process. With that, <clears throat> I think that question period is over in Regina now, so I think I can, I can stop. <clears throat> but I just want to, again, uh, thank you. Look forward to tomorrow uh, with the uh, dialogue sessions and the bear pit session. And uh, most importantly, thank you for what you do for all the citizens of the province, most of which we represent as well. So thank you very much. Um, so let's start with the uh, first question. You're here today presenting at SUMA. You're going to be giving a speech, or you have already given a speech by the time this airs. Um, what are you here talking about? So, you know, what I'm going to be talking about really kind of focuses more directly on the government relations, the, the municipal governments compared to the provincial government. and. The Premier, of course, spoke yesterday and his uh, talk was wide-ranging. It was really kind of a state of the province address and, you know, touched on all the different issues, whether it was health care, whether it was uh, the economy and, and the booming economy that we have. I'm going to focus in more on municipal issues. And uh, there's really probably about four or five topics that I'll be speaking on uh, regarding municipal revenue sharing is probably the most uh, top of mind for us. Uh, then there is the... Um, ICIP program, which is in, uh, Investing in Canada Infrastructure Program. Yep. That program, I'm going to talk about targeted sector support, which is uh, money that's set aside for uh, municipalities that want to kind of work together with other municipalities and they can bring in some expertise and there's some funding that will go along with that. I also want to talk a little bit about um, the engagement that we've had on the duty to consult policy because uh, I'm the minister responsible for First Nations and Métis relations, yeah. but it also impacts municipalities. And I just want to bring uh, the delegates up to date as to where we are on that process. The engagement is, has closed, uh, although we're still you know, talking to FSIN uh, if they want to have more input. And then kind of the recommendations, there's definitely some common themes. What the, I won't get into maybe the common themes yet, but then recommendations that will come from those to try and uh, improve the uh, policy framework. 
you know, it's worked really well. I mean, there's been a lot of investment come into this pro province over the last 10 years that has come in under the duty to consult. Yeah. But there is room for improvement. We know that. We hear it both from ex industry, SUMA, SARM, and we also hear it from First Nations. So uh, a, a little bit of a um, kind of an update on that. So those are kind of more um, targeted towards the municipal sector as opposed to, you know, uh, some of their concerns. And we'll have other ministers here at the dialogue bear session pit. and at the bear pit, you know, when it comes uh, to housing and addictions and mental health and uh, all of those. Mine is, uh, you know, a little more targeted. Municipalities are struggling right now. They have a lot of downloading from the federal government with the recent RCMP. They have the carbon tax. Do you see yourself as minister working in partnership and collaboratively with municipalities to try to find solutions to these uh, issues? Because when I was in some of the sessions earlier this morning listening to mayors, Reeves, and councillors, they're they're, they, they are saying that they don't feel heard. Are mm -hmm. you open to discussions with all mayors, Reeves, whether it be small town villages to larger cities? Absolutely. You know, I, I think... Uh you know, it's disconcerting when you hear that because I think we engage as much as we possibly can, yeah. uh, if not more. I, <laughs> we certainly want to. Um, you know, and I would just give an example of through the tough years of COVID for a couple of years, uh, we would, on depending on where we were in that process, we would set up a call every week with SUMA, SARM, New North, and all the city mayors. Uh, to discuss what was coming forward um, from our chief medical officer, the pressures that they were seeing. Uh, and, you know, as it kind of lightened up and we got away from some of the real intensity of the COVID issue, we backed it off to um, every once a month. And then it got more uh, active, the virus, and we were back to every two weeks. Yeah. And I've made an offer to them that we would continue that. We would have uh, government officials on the line too from health and education and and you know kind of so that they had the most recent uh, information and we have no problem doing that again into the future I mean we want to work collaboratively because quite frankly we represent the same constituents as they do I mean we we if you take Regina and Saskatoon as one constituency we represent every municipality in this province except for Cumberland which is La Ronge yeah. for example but every other RM and or city town village uh we have sas party government mlas on the ground that would meet at any given time so um you know we want to be as open and as collaborative can we address and grant them everything they want no just like when they meet with delegates within the city they, they can't meet all those either i mean they may want more revenue sharing they may not want the pst on on labor for example and we take all that into consideration, but we also have to supply brand new hospitals, healthcare, uh, education, highways, social services to all the people, their constituents too. You've literally taken one of the questions I asked municipal councillors that I've been asking them this week, and I'm gonna spin it on its head for you, uh, mm -hmm. Minister. Um, you're right, you can't supply everything to everyone because there's not enough money, and I, I'm 90% sure you know that mm -hmm. as well. How do you do it then? Because mm -hmm. At the end of the day, when a budget comes out, when a budget's presented, you might have to choose the winners and losers. And I'm not trying to be rude about nope, that statement, no, but at the end of the day, you only have a certain amount of money to go around. Like yeah. municipalities only have a certain amount of money, province does too. Yeah. How do you do that? And how do you work collaboratively with all areas of the province to ensure that everyone feels heard, but knowing that not everyone's going to get exactly what they want every single time? Right. So I'm going to take the very last part of that question and answer it first, and then I'll go to the Let's first part. Let's do it. Part. Is that <laughs> I've been around uh, and elected for a very long time and I was Minister of Health and I've had many different portfolios. And the one thing that I, I just want to try and reassure people is that if they didn't get what they want in the budget, it doesn't mean they weren't heard. Because often they'll say, well, you didn't put it in the budget so you didn't hear what we said. No, we heard what you said. You know, consultation and, and dialogue doesn't mean it's always going to end up the way you want it. And so we've heard, you know, the wants and the demands of the municipal sector. We go back and we have to balance it with all the other demands that are needed because it's not the only sector that's, that's looking for help. So, so what I would say is that, you know, I sit on Treasury Board. I cannot say that there is an idea that comes to Treasury Board that's a bad idea. 
But if there's a thousand good ideas and you can only fund 500, something has to drop. Yeah. And it, it, those are not easy discussions. I, I would think probably Treasury Board is the most difficult uh, committee that we have in government because we go through every budget. Every budget comes in with more ask than what we can pay for because that's what they've heard from their constituents or stakeholders. And then we as a government, as a Treasury Board, first kind of decide this is the budget. Then we have to go to Cabinet, get it through Cabinet. Then we go to caucus and get it through caucus. So there are many eyes that look at it, but it, it is never a decision between a good idea and a bad idea. It's a decision between good ideas, but you only have so much money to fund. So I'm going so. to end on this question because I know you're a busy man, uh, Minister. So I'm going to ask, does, do municipalities, villages, towns, cities have a partner in this government? Well, I think they do, and I, I think they do um, just on one program alone, municipal revenue sharing. I would say that if you were to talk to municipalities across the country, they would envy the partnership that we have. They do. I have talked to a lot who have said Saskatchewan's revenue sharing is a little bit better than their province. They wish yeah. they had it. Right, right. And so, for example, it's three quarters of 1% of the PST from two years ago. This year... The municipal revenue sharing pool, three quarters of 1% from two years ago, is just under $300 million that will go to municipalities with virtually no strings attached. We may think, we have MLAs in, I'm the MLA for Indian Head Milestone. Fort Capel has, is getting municipal revenue sharing. I may think it should go to fix that street. That's not my call. Yeah. It's the community's call. And that's a beautiful program. It's gone up 13% year over year. So, yeah, I, I think we've got a good partnership. Um, can it, like with any partnership, can it improve? Absolutely, and we're open to those, those conversations. Were you um, eavesdropping on Randy Golden's conversation with me? <laughs> because she said that exact same line, that it can always be better. Yeah, absolutely. I don't know a relationship that can't improve. And we're, we're part of it. It's, it's ever-evolving. But I would say that from my history of eight years in opposition and now 15 years in government, the relationship between municipal governments and our government compared to the relationship with municipal governments and the previous government is day and night. And any of the members that were here 15, 16, 17 years ago, I think would echo that, especially on the rural municipal side. Why do you say that? When Do you think you're a better partner with rural municipalities than when, the previous government? They, because I had Matt Love sitting in that chair as like about two hours ago, and he said the exact opposite. His his party is better. He has a better relationship than. He should he should have been around <laughs> when uh, the former government, the NDP government, would come to Suma and especially Sarm. Bear pits had a name Bear Pit because it was ugly. Have a listen tomorrow and see what the, the dialogue is. I put ours, our, put our government up any day to what the NDP's past history has been. Minister, thank you so much. Thank you. Now we have NDP MLA Matt Love's speech and one-on-one -on -one interview. But first, for clarification reasons, I want to say that Saskatchewan NDP leader Carla Beck was to be in attendance, but due to a conflict, she was unable to appear. So... Let's sit down and hear what Matt Love had to say. Uh, you're all leaders from hometowns from across our great province, and I want to welcome you here to my hometown, Saskatoon. It's a wonderful gathering place for us this morning and for you in your, in your convention time here. Uh, I want to begin by expressing my gratitude as we gather in Treaty 6 territory to those original inhabitants of this land, the First Nations people, Métis people and nations that have been stewards of this land for many generations before I was fortunate to come here and raise a family. My wife and I are raising three kids in the community that I represent and I know that uh, as we gather here today in the spirit of, of treaty and relationship, I want to reaffirm my own commitment to sharing the land, to learning from one another, and to living in harmony together. I want to thank Randy for that, that introduction uh, and, and, and also reaffirm uh, from the official opposition how much we value this relationship with SUMA, uh, your leadership, Randy, and, and all the, the leaders who gather in this room, how important it is 
that we work together, we are truly stronger together uh, as, we, as we learn to listen, work, and advocate for the people of Saskatchewan through that relationship. Uh, now, unfortunately, Carla could not be with us this morning. Uh, and I do have some experience that's prepared me for this. Before I was elected, uh, I was a teacher. And I did spend some time as a substitute teacher. And if you follow along, uh, I guess I'm now uh, in my first role as a substitute politician. <laughs> Getting the call at the last minute to uh, step up and, and, uh, and bring, bring remarks on behalf of the Saskatchewan NDP opposition. Now, Carla did share some advice from me as her substitute. And she said that politicians have two ears and one mouth and that I should keep my remarks brief, which I will for two reasons. Uh, a, I'm not the leader that you left the trade show to come listen to. Uh, and, and B, I'd, I'd much rather uh, spend as much time as possible chatting offstage, uh, listening to you. And I invite anyone here who would like a conversation uh, today with me, whether it relates to one of my critic areas or anything that I can share with any members of our, our team in opposition. Um, looking forward to those, those conversations. And uh, please, I'm, I'm very approachable. Uh, if there's anything you'd like to discuss, don't be afraid to, uh, to grab me in the, in the lunch line or I'll be back at the banquet tonight and, and we can have those conversations. That's so important because you truly are the people that Saskatchewan looks to first for help and leadership. Mayors, councillors, when folks have a problem, we know it's your doors that they knock on. In our communities, uh, folks know you. They trust you. That's how you got to where you are today. No matter the size of the community, whether you've been a local leader for roughly three years, like myself, or maybe for decades, 30 or 40 years, I know we have people in this room that have served for nearly as long as I've, I've been alive. We also know that you were likely leaders before you got elected. That's how you earned the, the trust to be an elected leader in your community. And it likely started then that you struggled to go to a grocery store with your, maybe with your children in tow without somebody stopping you to talk about a concern that they have, to ask a question about a decision that you made that affected their life. Or maybe going to your kid's hockey practice or standing on the soccer pitch and folks have insight that they want to offer you, some way that, that you can work to make their life better. Your community knows you, they rely on you, and they see you out there delivering on our most important public services. Day in and day out, you do this work. Saskatchewan is known for tight-knit communities. It's one of the things that makes our province so great are those connections and relationships and the reliance that we have on one another. Where neighbors actually know neighbors. And that means that you're connected. That connection, that's our strength in this province. You understand what your community needs and other levels of government can and should be important partners in that work. If responsibility is downloaded, well the right funding and the right support sure as heck better come with it. But let's not kid ourselves. We know that Ottawa and Regina aren't in touch at the grassroots level like you are. And often, the older that a government gets, no matter the party or the level, the more they think that they've got it all figured out and they know what's best. And I've heard many of you say that this is a real challenge. I share your concerns working with a government that keeps you in the dark or makes important decisions for you but without you. And that's not a partnership. Saskatchewan's brightest days are ahead, but we can only achieve that by working together. That's our vision for the Saskatchewan NDP. Stronger together, working in partnership, in relationship, with a common vision for the future of our province. And I want to explain where some of these comments are coming from in my recent experience as critic for rural and remote health care. I've been hitting the road uh, a lot over the last few months 
with my colleague Vicki Moa at the MLA for Saskatoon Fairview and our health critic. And we've, all, we've been invited out to communities. Uh, we've reached out to communities where we know they've experienced healthcare disruptions, challenges in, in staffing their facilities, challenges in providing the health care that people need where they need it, when they need it. We've been touring the province for one reason, to listen to folks, to build relationships and to reaffirm our commitment and our vision of being stronger together, working with local leaders and local voices in your communities. Along the way, we've also, due to the thousands of kilometers we've racked up, we've been supporting your local businesses, like your local automotive repair shops, your local bakeries. Vicky's got a love for cinnamon buns. She brings one home in every community we visit for her partner, Grayson. And I'm often in search of the best burger. Right now, um, in top place is Southie. Anyone from Southie here? Yeah, got a great burger there. So we've been trying to hear from as many local leaders as possible. Mayors, councillors, local doctors, uh, folks who work on their, their local district uh, health committees, nurses, nurse practitioners, care aides, folks who work in long-term care, hospitals, acute care, you name it. And if I had to bet the farm on one thing, if there's one thing that's emerged from all of these outreach meetings and relationship building, that one thing is that local voices matter. The solutions that exist in your communities are there for the challenges we face in healthcare, challenges we face in economic growth, ensuring that we have good jobs for people in their communities, the challenges we face in education, ensuring that local school boards have autonomy to make good decisions that are right for their children and for their schools. The decisions that are made for the delivery of social services absolutely need local voices, and we know that when decisions are made without them, that folks fall through the cracks. Folks aren't getting the support that they need to be healthy and to live healthy. These solutions can and should be found at the local level that you know best. That's the way I see it. That's the value of the Saskatchewan NDP caucus. Saskatchewan has all the ingredients to boom, and to boom in a big way. We have the heart, we have the talent, and we've got the work ethic. Passionate folks with the finger on the pulse and innovative ideas in the works. What we need is a provincial government that listens. A government that gives local leaders the tools to deliver for their communities. We know that you feel that pressure when folks aren't having their needs met, when healthcare facilities are experiencing disruptions or shutdowns, we know that you feel that pressure and you need to have a seat at the table for your solutions to come forward. That type of collaborative work could also begin today by removing the PST on construction. Many of you, myself included, and in our NDP caucus have been raising the alarm on this for five years. We know that in your communities, 24 to 39 percent of your municipal revenue sharing grants are spent on PST for infrastructure projects. Many of those projects funded through ISIP grants, and it's a double tax. And at the end of the day, it forces you, in many cases, to increase taxes for your ratepayers to be stuck with a higher bill. And that, that gets uh, passed on, and we know that you're feeling that in your communities and around the tables where you sit and make decisions. We've heard you, and we echo your call. We want to remove barriers for growth and encourage local economic development any way we can. And that starts by listening to you. Again, that's our vision. Working with you in relationship and listening to local voices. I know many of you also have no love for the PST on event tickets. It's sometimes called the fun tax by folks in the media. I don't have any love for that either. We've missed out throughout the last few years on major shows, big events, and the economic spin-off that they bring. We know that the margins in the entertainment sector are slim enough as it is, and just when our arts and culture, tourism, and big events are getting back on their feet, uh, they're being stuck with a tax that is hurting that development. Our restaurants and hospitality sector were hit with new PST, 
and all of this during a cost of living crisis, no less. So let's scrap the PST on events and concerts and encourage folks to get out and support their communities. Now the last thing that I'll mention is the cost of living crisis. It's been a real challenge in many of our communities. We know that this is not just in our, our largest communities in the province. When I get out into communities to talk about healthcare, we hear about the impacts of CIS. We hear about concerns of housing people. We know, I know in the city where I live, here in Saskatoon, we know that this is a major concern. The city I was in yesterday in Regina, we know it's a big concern, but I hear it when we get out into smaller urban centers as well. The cost of living crisis has created a real challenge across this province, and Saskatchewan folks look out for each other. It's who we are. We work together to get the job done. But we're also a proud bunch, and it's not often that we like to admit that we need help. But when you look at the numbers, folks in our province need a helping hand in a bad way right now. Angus Reid just released a new survey a few weeks back that indicated that Saskatchewan people report the highest rates of financial insecurity in the entire country. Folks here are more likely than anywhere else in Canada to cut back on spending, more likely to struggle to pay for groceries. We're more likely than anywhere in Canada to draw down savings to make ends meet. Inflation coupled with higher energy rates, higher power bills means that we have pressures in our community that lead to more homelessness. We know that we have addictions and mental health crises that are making this situation worse. And let's not kid ourselves, it's, it is getting worse. Day by day, we see these pressures increasing and leading to greater homelessness. We know that that puts pressure on you as local leaders, that this is often downloaded for you to solve without the support and the resources that you need. We know that we have higher vacancy rates, more folks choosing between eating or heating. And all of this, while we have thousands of vacant housing units spread across this province. This is not the Saskatchewan that I believe in, and I don't think that these are the values that we have as leaders in our province. Let's use those units to get folks housed. Housing people is the first step to solving many of these problems that we all know well. I don't need to go through that list. I know that you know these problems as well as I do and as well as the folks who work in the legislature, folks who sit around your council tables know these well. So let's ensure that every level of government is working together, working together to make life more affordable for the people that we represent. Let's get back to common sense solutions. I firmly believe that working together, we can and will meet our full potential as a province. Some of the most talented people who will make that happen are already on board, and many of them are in the room here with us today. I know that we can deliver a better future, the future that we want for our province, for our kids, for our grandkids, and for future generations with good jobs that we can all be proud of clean air and water that we share in the spirit of the treaty, strong communities, good schools, and, and hospitals that are there for us when we need them. Like I said before, our best days are ahead of us, and we look forward to building them with you together. Thank you. Um, so Matt, thank you so much for doing this. I, wa I want to start with this. You're here at SUMA right now. You just present it to the delegations. What, 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 what message do you bring from the NDP? The message that, that I brought on behalf of our leader, Carla Back, is that we're stronger together. That we believe that listening to local voices is vitally important because um, you know, those who are elected in their communities, whether they be councillors or mayors, and, and I might even add you know, school trustees and other elected folks, they know their communities best and they're being shut out of decision making by this provincial government. The South Party government has eliminated local voices from healthcare decision making, decision making in terms of economic growth and what we need to do to move forward as a province. Um, school boards are feeling a loss of local autonomy and the decisions that they make. And we think that's the wrong direction to go. 
and to be clear, the right direction to go is working together, finding strength in those connections, including local voices to make sure that our hospitals are open when you need them, our schools are meeting the needs of the children and youth in your community, and our economies are growing in a way that support good, well-paying local jobs for people so our communities can thrive. Now, before you got here, there was a, a town session that was happening with uh, representatives from towns, and I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to put you on the spot here, but they felt, from the, what I heard from the open forum that they had, that this government isn't listening, isn't hearing them, and is treating them like a second-class group. Do you agree with that? I hear that every town I visit. Really? So I've been, one of my critic areas is uh, critic for rural and remote health care. You must and have been sitting in that session because that's exactly <laughs> what they were talking about when they so, talk like that. Well, that's, that's, that's what they say to us. That's why they're inviting, inviting us out to their communities to sit around their council tables, to visit their facilities, and to learn what's, what's impacting the people that, that they represent. Because they're feeling that pressure from the folks that elect them. They feel pressure too when their hospital's closed. They feel pressure too when their doctor moves away. And yet they have no seat at the table. Our province, when we amalgamated health regions, committed to enhancing something called community health advisory networks. Instead of enhancing them, they've been demolished altogether. And now all of that healthcare decision making comes out of Regina. And they've lost that connection. They've lost that connection to the local leaders who know their communities, they know their facilities, they know their workforce, but they have no voice at the table. So what would you, what would the NDP, the Saskatchewan NDP today, want to see the, to improve the betterment of the relationship between the province and municipalities? And when I say municipalities, I don't just mean towns and cities, I mean the small villages as well. Yeah, well, one of the comments I made today, and, uh, you know, I tried to sit in a way that would, that would land with the folks in the room. When, when governments get long in the tooth, they... And I think this is across political stripes, I really do. Yeah. They start to feel like they've got it all figured out. They know what you need and your voice isn't needed. That's what we're seeing today in Saskatchewan. This government has been in power for over 15 years and they've stopped listening. Um, that's what I hear when we visit communities. It's what I hear as education critic. It's what I hear as critic for rural or remote healthcare. I hear it with seniors issues too quite frankly they're they're taking folks for granted and so what you can expect out of us is doing the work to build those relationships uh one of the things that, that our leader carla beck says that we need to do a better job of in opposition because we we want to form government that's our goal is to get into into rooms and around tables that we haven't been for a long time that we 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 can't be afraid to go into communities, even if it looks like maybe we don't, haven't had electoral success there for a while, we'll be there. We want to build those relationships. We want to build that trust and, and earn that trust um, well before the next election rolls around. I've sat down with a few mayors and councillors in the last two days that I've been here, and one of the issues, and it's to your portfolio, is rural health. Mm -hmm. I just sat down with the town of Radville's mayor, and he said that there's concerns that the doctor shortage, the nurse shortage, is causing emergency rooms to be closed for three days a week. Yeah. How do we solve that? How do we solve it? Okay, well, we, how do we solve it from a municipal perspective, working with them? If we want to talk about solutions, we have to do two things. Listen to local voices. Okay, that's, that's the message. But we also have to look at where we've been, right? So we need to look back and, and say that in 15 years under the SAS party government, has healthcare gotten better or worse? And by every conceivable metric, it's getting worse. Surgical wait times, worse. Um, wait times to ha make an appointment, to have a, see a family doctor, if you're lucky to have one. We've got roughly in an estimate of 200,000 people in this province don't have access to a family doctor, primary care. Um, these are, this is all, I lay all of this at the feet of this SAS party government. They can't blame their predecessors. They've been in power for 15 years. This is all at their feet. So we need to look at where we've been. It's taken us a long time to get to where we are now. This didn't happen overnight. We've been calling for years, for years, for a health human resource roundtable approach, bringing together 
different levels of government, healthcare workers, healthcare unions that represent their workers who know what's happening to find solutions together. That call has been rejected time after time by this government. Our Saskatchewan Union of Nurses is calling for a nursing task force so that their voice can be heard. That has been rejected by this government. In fact, when we raised this in the assembly, our health minister accused us of not paying attention by standing up for the inclusion of nurses in finding solutions. So I'll tell you what, if I have to choose between trusting this government or trusting nurses, I'm trusting the nurses to have the information and the ideas of what we need to solve things. If you're gonna ask me between trusting this health minister who's led us to this position, by every metric, the worst response in the country to the COVID pandemic that has led to burnout, that has led to early retirement, has led to people not choosing a career in healthcare. And yet he's asking us to trust him instead of trusting nurses, care aides, doctors, local leaders. I'm not trusting this government anymore. I'm trusting those local leaders, those healthcare workers who have been shut out and and quite frankly, silenced by this government. We want to take a moment and thank Minister McMorris and MLA Love for taking time out of their busy schedule and chatting with us about how they see their respective parties working with municipalities and how they plan on addressing the issues raised at this year's SUMA conference. Over the course of the three days I was in attendance at SUMA, one thing came clear from delegates and local elected leaders. Municipalities matter. No matter how big or small, municipalities are the pillar our communities stand on. And when federal and provincial politicians don't work collaboratively with their municipal counterpart, it only hurts one thing, the people. Now remember to subscribe and follow us for more great content as we continue to bring you in-depth interviews with municipally elected leaders from across Canada. And also mark your calendars because during the month of May, every Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we will be airing interviews with delegates from this year's SUMA conference. So stay tuned for more thought-provoking conversations about the issues that matter most to our communities. Thank you for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. And remember, just keep talking. <music>